Here Jesus says, blessed are. Now, what is Jesus talking about when he says blessed? What, what does he have in mind? Uh, one way to do that is to look at how the word blessed is used in the rest of Matthew. That's a good idea when you read the Bible. Read it in context. How is this word used elsewhere? And you see it used three other times. Uh, and I think the, but I think the place where it's most helpful is uh, in Matthew chapter 24, where uh, Jesus talks about a parable, uh, a parable of two servants and the need to be ready for the master's return. The master goes away, uh, one servant kicks back because he's lazy uh, and he just relaxes, does nothing, uh, and he gets surprised when the master finally returns. Uh, the other servant is diligent, he works hard and he waits expectantly looking forward to the master's return. Now, Jesus clearly wants Christians to be like the faithful servant, the one who's ready and waiting for the master. And at the conclusion of Jesus' teaching, he says, blessed is that servant who expects his master's return, who's waiting for him, the one who's, who's doing the right thing. And the master approves of him, right? It's the language of approval. This is what it is to be blessed, approved by God. So when, uh, back in Jesus' day, when uh, Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says, uh, blessed are these people, he's saying these are the people who have God's approval. These are the ones who are in a right relationship with God. They're the ones who are blessed. That's what it is to be blessed. So here he's giving a description of what it looks like to be blessed. Uh, it's a very famous passage, uh, even if it is hard to say. The Beatitudes is the first part of it, this list of blessings. And these are the ones who God says they will receive God's blessing. Now, they, the way they work is there's kind of two parts to them. Uh, if you've got to look at your Bible there, there's the first part where it gives a description of the one who is blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, is the first one there in verse 3, the first half of it. And then the second part uh, gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of transformation that happens for each one. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, description, here's the transformation, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, verse 6 there, but then the transformation, for they will be filled. There's two parts to each one. Uh, so what we're going to do is look at them in that way. Now, there's the first part that describes what it is to be blessed, and then there's the second part that's the promise. Uh, and so we're going to start off looking at those who are approved by God. Uh, now, if I were to go around the room and ask whose approval you most valued, I think I could take a punt at what uh, the people you, you might say, uh, a spouse, a best friend, uh, the people who are closest to us, I think. Uh, they're the approval that we long for most. Uh, we crave that. We hate disappointing those we love. Uh, we hate letting them down. Now, this passage tells us about what it is to be approved of by the one whose opinion matters most. Uh, Jesus tell is telling us who is approved of by God, who is blessed, who's in the right with God. This is what you need to aim for this year. Uh, this is a well-known list, but perhaps a little understood list, at least that's what John Stott says, uh, well, most well-known and yet least understood passage in the Bible. Uh, and that's because I think our familiarity can lead us to miss just how radical it is, what Jesus is saying here. Um, and I hope that as you keep in mind those things that you had in mind for for what would look like a blessed year. Uh, as we read what Jesus says here, you might feel the radical nature of it, the challenge that he puts to you. These are the ones who are blessed. Now, I think it would have been challenging to Jesus' first audience as well, because in their mind, the blessed ones are those who are the rich, the religious, and the righteous. Right? If you were rich, then clearly you were in in God's favour. He, he had approved of you. Uh, if you were religious, very serious about your religion, you know, the Pharisees, for instance, 
they were the ones who would people would say are blessed. And so you can imagine that. And so surely as Jesus looks to the crowd and looks not to the religious, the rich, but instead to the poor, the lowly, and says, these ones are the ones who are blessed. You can imagine just how controversial that might have been. It's the spiritually bankrupt that Jesus says are blessed. They're confronting words and radical words in the first century. They're confronting and radical now as well. Um, as we look at the details of each of these, um, we'll see how they actually build on one another and how they kind of hold together. And although it's not an exact way of dividing it up, I think we can kind of divide it up into the first four and then the second four. Um, so I've got the first four on this screen. Uh, and if you were looking in a commentary or if you were looking in the uh, original Greek, uh, you'll see that the first four all start with the same letter. So it's clear that uh, they're grouped together. If you were reading it in the original, you would go, oh, yeah, this is a grouping. Um, and all of these four speak of spiritual bankruptcy. The poor in spirit. Those who mourn. The humble. Uh, and, and those who thirst for hunger and righteousness. And they're, they're all talking about spiritual bankruptcy. The second four are a little different. They're focused more on the transformation that happens to those people. Now, blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted. It's kind of a little bit further down the track. Now, as I say, it's not a very clear, distinct distinction, um, but it's kind of helpful, I think, for understanding the passage. So, the people who are approved by God are spiritually bankrupt. This is our first point. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says. Uh, the Bible speaks a lot about economic poverty, uh, but Jesus is not talking about that here. Uh, he's talking about poverty of spirit. Uh, the person who is approved by God realizes that they are spiritually bankrupt. They've got nothing in the bank. Uh, they don't lay claim on God's approval because they think they've earned it. Look at my bank account, Jesus. No. Uh, or because they deserve it. Uh, they realize that they have nothing. Uh, you get this uh, right through the Bible. This is not news. Uh, God says in, in Isaiah 57, he says, I live in a high and holy place. Right? This is the God who is holy above all and with the oppressed and lowly of, of spirit. Uh, this is the nature of who God is. God is pleased with those who are lowly of spirit. Uh, the one who realizes that they have nothing, that they have no claim on God's blessing. Uh, that this isn't a false humility. I oh, don't, no, you know, I'm awful. I'm awful. Trust me, I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, it's not false humility. This is kind of the deepest form of repentance. As we understand who we are in and of ourselves, right? In our state before God without Jesus. Uh, if we think of Luke's gospel, um, You'll see there in Jesus' parable of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Do you know that story where they, they both go up to the temple to pray? Uh, the Pharisee goes close and looks up to heaven with his hands open and says, Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men, the greedy, the adulterers, right? Or even like that tax collector over there. Uh, the tax collector, meanwhile, stands or kneels far off, beats his chest and says, have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. And Jesus finishes that story by saying, the one who went home justified, right, the one who went home approved of by God, was the tax collector. They were the one who is blessed. Now, that is very encouraging, I think. Uh, hugely encouraging. It's not the spiritually successful who are blessed by God. It's the ones who recognize that they don't have anything to offer before God, who have his approval. The spiritually bankrupt, right? If you recognize you've got nothing, then that is where you need to be. That's a good place to be. They're the ones who are blessed. 
But there is also a challenge there, isn't there? Because if you're a person who goes to church faithfully, who's active in the church and in your community, and you've got a good kind of personal devotional life, and, you know, really things are just ticking along nicely in your Christian walk, if that's you, then the danger is that you start to think of yourself more highly than you ought. You start to think that you're a, bit, a little bit better. Why can't they just get their act together, you know? And you start to look down on others around you. Uh, you might start to th- take some credit for your faith. But whoever we are, however much growth God has worked in us, and that is a good thing if you can look at your life and go, I have these habits that draw me nearer to God. They're good things to thank God for. But however much growth God has worked in your life, we must acknowledge our innate spiritual poverty. That in and of ourselves, we have nothing to offer. God might have changed us, but we don't take the credit for that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. <clears throat> Blessed are those who mourn. Now, mourning here is kind of the emotional side of being poor in spirit. Uh, if you're poor in spirit, you recognize your spiritual bankruptcy, uh, you're going to mourn over that fact. You're going to feel grief over that spiritual bankruptcy. It, it should grieve us. Uh, It's not okay to be casual about your sin. If you don't spend time confessing your sin to God, that says something about your heart. You've started to presume on the grace of God and not value it. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying here that we should be constantly walking around in sackcloth and ashes and just always introspective and saying woe is me you know but i do think that there should be a constant awareness of our sin a a dissatisfaction with our sin this translates to our hunger to grow and change uh, which we'll look at in a sec but it also translates to how we relate to others uh, which is the next thing jesus says blessed are those who mourn blessed are the humble or the meek if you've got a different translation Uh, that's the logical progression of being poor in spirit Um, actually because if you know that you have nothing to offer god except your failure then it only makes sense that you're not really going to look down on others are you because you're a failure right so how are you going to look down on anyone else you're going to be humble you're going to be meek toward them If you know that you are spiritually bankruptcy, you're not going to judge others for their spiritual bankruptcy. Um, Your attitude will be one of humility. So what does that mean? Meekness. We don't use that word much. And humility kind of gets at it a bit. Um, Again, uh, in Matthew's gospel, uh, meek is used again, or humble, uh, and it's used to describe Jesus. And so... As you read through Matthew's Gospel, if you want to know what meekness looks like, what humility looks like, you look at Jesus. Jesus says himself, he is lowly and humble of heart or meek. Uh, And you see that uh, meekness might not be what you'd expect because Jesus, even though he is humble and meek, he still has strong things to say against the Pharisees, right? Uh, Meekness does not mean weakness. He says to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you nest of snakes, right? Strong, cutting words. So you can be humble and meek and yet still confront evil and sin. So what I think that means, I think this is what it means, is that when someone criticizes you, is perhaps mean towards you, Uh, you don't particularly feel the need to defend yourself because you're humble and you say, they're probably right. (laughs) Actually, they don't really know, have the depth of that, you know, issue that I have. I'm worse than they think. And so you're humble about yourself. But if someone is to attack uh, the powerless, if there is evil going on around you, then you confront that 
you'll stand up against that. Uh, we see it, I, I think, uh, in Philippians 1 with uh, the Apostle Paul, right? Uh, he says there that uh, other preachers, uh, you know, they're, they're speaking badly of him, they're slandering him, and he says, I don't care, because they're preaching the gospel. They might be tearing me down, and that's not fair, but I'm not worried about that. In contrast, in Galatians, where other preachers are twisting the gospel and so abusing God's church, well, then he comes out strongly with cutting hard words. I think that's a little picture of what meekness and humility mean. When we're insulted, we act like Jesus. What did he do? He turned the other cheek. But in the face of evil, we stand up and we speak out against evil and sin. So, blessed are the humble. These are the things that you're looking for this year. Blessed are, the hum- blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Verse 6. Okay, so we know that we are spiritually poor. We know that we, we aren't to look casually on our sin and we mourn for our sin and we, we don't look up, down on others for their sin. And yet we know as Christians that we want to change, we want to grow. And so we hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are the ones who are approved by God. Now, that's a challenging verse. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What do you hunger and thirst for? What are the things you really want? What was on your list of a blessed blessed year? Comfort, ease, everyone getting along. Jesus says the Christian approved by God hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Uh, What are we talking about when we talk about righteousness? What does that mean? Again, in in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus speaks a lot about righteousness. And later on in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus will say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's easy for us to think about that in moral terms, uh, moralistic terms, being good, right? Now, that would be difficult because that would be just about impossible. No one exceeded the Pharisees in terms of their moral uh, goodness, in terms of following those external laws. Uh, But in righteousness, in Matthew's Gospel, is not primarily about external obedience. Primarily... It's about the heart. It does relate to our behaviour, but it's much more fundamental than that. It's about internal transformation. That's what righteousness is, about having a changed heart, a right heart. And again, throughout Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talks about the heart lots of times, right? So he says, it's not enough to avoid physical adultery, we have to avoid adultery of the heart. Uh, And he says, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. He says, the mouth speaks out of the overflow of the heart. Right? Righteousness is not primarily about right behavior. It is about a right heart. And a right heart will overflow in right behavior. Uh, Now, this is why we are to thirst and hunger for it. A, A right heart because we don't have it, because we need it given to us. You cannot change your own heart. You cannot perform heart surgery on yourself. Uh, And so we thirst and hunger for it. You thirst and hunger for that which you don't have, right? If you're thirsty and hungry, if if you've got a full fridge, right? You're not thirsty and hungry. You just go to the fridge and grab a can of Coke Zero or whatever it is that you want, right? You just get it if your fridge is full. But if your fridge is empty and your cupboards are bare, well, then you're thirsty and hungry. Then you need something. 
And righteousness in Matthew's gospel is not something that we can produce by ourselves. We recognize that we are spiritually bankrupt. And so we long to be changed and spiritually transformed by God. And so that's what it looks like to be approved of by God. And then we see what it looks like to be transformed, right? Uh, and so the, first, the second four of these. So verse 7, blessed are the merciful. Um, again, there's another relational aspect to being poor in spirit. Uh, similar to being humble, uh, blessed are the merciful. And so when we know that God has been infinitely merciful toward us, well, then how are we going to act towards someone else? We're going to be merciful toward them. Later in Matthew, uh, Jesus tells the parable of uh, a man who owes his master an inconceivable amount of money, right? Like 10,000 talents, which is like billions of dollars, uh, it translates today. Um, he can't pay, of course, uh, but amazingly, the master, incredibly, the master forgives him his debt. Astounding. He says, don't have to pay a cent. The guy leaves, and as no sooner has he left, and he goes and finds someone who owes him a hundred like a few thousand dollars. And he bails him up and says, where's my money? He can't pay. What does he do? He chucks him in prison until he pays back every last penny. Uh, that is not the model. Um, Jesus is exaggerating to make the point, of course. We can so easily become bitter and resentful toward those who have wronged us. And he's saying, just remember who you are. Remember the mercy that you've received. Um, we see a beautiful example of this, uh, I think, in our inside just recently uh, with the Abdullah family uh, from Oatlands. Uh, I don't know if you recall, about a year ago, uh, four children, three from the one family plus a cousin, uh, were killed by a drunk driver. Uh, they were out getting ice creams. And a uh, drunk driver mounted the curb, killed these four uh, children. Um, that's about a year ago. And the parents, uh, the Christian family, uh, and the parents have launched a, a day of forgiveness to commemorate their children. Uh, they came out, I think it might have been that very day, and said, I don't feel anger or hatred toward the driver. Uh, I want to forgive him. A beautiful example of what it is to be merciful. Um, we have been forgiven an immense debt. So we forgive others. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, the next one. Now, this idea of being pure in heart is not so much about moral purity. Right? We've already kind of addressed that. Uh, this idea is of being single-minded, pure, like just white paint uh, without any uh, colour in it, having a single purpose and direction. Uh, the goal and focus of our lives is to be singular. It's to be for God. It's what it's all for. And so our hearts are not meant to be divided. Our hearts are meant to be devoted to God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Are you praying for that for this year, that you'll be pure in your heart, devoted to God? Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, through his uh, death and resurrection, Jesus brought peace between humans and God. And so to be a peacemaker is to be like God. Uh, blessed are those who are peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted, as we come to the last one, persecuted because of righteousness. Now, Jesus expands on what he means there in verse 11. He says, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I want you to just notice that Jesus defines righteousness here in terms of relationship to him. He doesn't say blessed are those who persecuted because they've got a critical and argumentative spirit, right? Um, no, that's just called being a jerk. Uh, he's not giving approval for that. He's saying uh, 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for holding firmly to Jesus and saying this, I believe. Now, thankfully, I don't think we get much of that in this country yet. But it's not too hard to imagine our culture heading down that path in the not too distant future. And so blessed are those who are persecuted because of their allegiance to Jesus. Now, I know it's been very quick and we could spend a long time going through all of those. It might have already felt like a long time. But do you see how upside down this picture is of what it is to be blessed? How challenging this is. Blessed are those who are persecuted because they have God's favour. The ones who are blessed by God are the ones who are persecuted by men. It's a very upside down picture of what it is to be blessed. That's what it is to be approved by God. That's about 90% of my talk. I want to spend the last 10% uh, thinking about how they're transformed. Um, at that point, I think when you get to that end of that list, you might be thinking, why on earth would you sign up for this? Like, who, is anyone attracted by this picture? Is this really what it means to look like to be blessed? Jesus does show us why it's worth it. If I could be so crass, uh, there is cash value here uh, for pursuing this blessed way of life. Uh, and the cash value, the benefit, I guess, is the kingdom of heaven. You see there in verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And he finishes it in verse 10, if you look in your Bible. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. He starts off with the kingdom of heaven and he finishes it with the kingdom of heaven. And in the middle is what that actually looks like to live that way. That's the way he structured it. Now, uh, it's worth saying the kingdom of heaven here is not referring to heaven. Uh, we might think it is. It's not just referring to heaven, to where you go when you die. It is referring to uh, all that belongs to God. Everyone and everything that belongs to God. It's God's being part of God's people, being part of God's family. And in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven is here in Jesus. And these Beatitudes give us a snapshot of what it looks like to be part of God's kingdom. So what does it look like? Verse 4. It means to be comforted. Verse 5, it means to inherit the earth. Verse 6, it means to have the promise of being filled and satisfied. Verse 7, it's the promise of having mercy. Verse 8, it's the promise of actually seeing God. And verse 9, it's the promise of being God's child. This is the transformation. This is what it is to be part of God's, God's kingdom. See, our, our world wants instant gratification. Jesus promises an eternal future. Our world wants things, stuff. Jesus promises us God himself. Our world wants to be proved right. To take the high ground. And Jesus promises mercy. This is the kingdom of heaven. He promises those with nothing to offer, short of nothing short of dwelling in the new earth, new earth and new heaven with him forever. I don't know what this year is going to bring. And it's a challenge but I want to pray that it is a blessed year. That we grow in these things. That we grow in our poverty of spirit, our humility, our thirst and hunger for righteousness, 
that we might receive these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that in spite of what looks uh, hopeless, what might seem uh, just worthless in this life, that you give us, you promise us an eternal future. You promise us that this life is worth living and worth living for you even when it might be hard and even when it might be disappointing. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be conformed to Jesus' vision of what it looks like to be blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So that we throw off the world's expectations, our own desires of heart, that our hearts might thirst and hunger for you for righteousness and that we might rejoice in the incredible gift they've given us in Jesus, our peacemaker. Let me pray this in his name. Amen. Just a couple of thoughts about remembrance as we come to take bread and wine. Uh, some of you probably realise I like to paint and I've been looking at a particular project that's to do with Gallipoli and it's all about remembering Gallipoli. And so I looked at this material and I've sort of tried to get my head around it and I, I thought it was interesting as I thought about remembrance today as we're coming to do what we now do. And this particular uh, project, it's an art prize, but they've actually come up with a creed and a set of words that they say, this is what we'd like you to focus on as you prepare artwork <clears throat> and present it to us. And there's a club called the Gallipoli Memorial Club. Obviously, it's run through RSLs and things like that. But they've got this creed that says, we believe that within the community there exists an obligation for all to preserve the special qualities of loyalty, respect, love of country, courage and comradeship, which were personified by the heroes of the Gallipoli campaign and bequeathed to all humanity as a foundation for, 